Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do a companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net if you have suggestions for topics guests and other ideas please send them to info@scientificsense.com and i can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Martin Kuldorf, who is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is an expert on infectious disease outbreaks. As a biostatistician, he has developed methods for the early detection and monitoring of disease outbreaks, currently used by many public health departments for covid-19 and other diseases he has also developed methods for the early detection of drug and vaccine adverse events welcome martin thank you very much it's a great pleasure to talk to you uh so i want to start with um one of your recent articles um with uh, the nyc nyc health department early detection of localized covid-19 outbreaks and flare ups Uh, in which you uh, you say to quickly detect hotspots the new york city health department launched a covid uh, percent positivity cluster detection system using census tract resolution and the sat scan prospective poisson based space time scan statistic and soon after implementation the system prompted an investigation identifying a gathering with inadequate social distancing where viral transmission likely occurred could you talk a bit about that uh, about the system uh, yes so i've been working with the new york city health department for many years uh, on uh, outbreak detection and uh, uh, they have for example put a system in place where they monitor all reportable diseases like salmonella or legionnaire's disease yeah and the idea is uh, as soon as if there's an outbreak whether it's uh, food contamination due to salmonella or there was a uh, legionnaire's disease outbreak in bronx a few years ago uh, where the disease was spread through uh, uh, cooling towers the idea is if you can detect those outbreaks sooner you can put in preventive measures sooner and therefore you can save uh, lives uh, and you can sort of uh, get rid of the of the source more quickly. Yeah. Now of course COVID-19 operates a little bit differently because in COVID-19 it's already here. Right. Uh so there the uh, the purpose is a little bit different. It is okay so we have COVID-19 in the in New York City but is there suddenly like a flare up? Yeah. Uh that uh, suddenly in some neighborhood it increases. and then you might want to put in uh, put, uh, measures there you might for example do educational measures to say okay right now it's pretty uh, there's a lot of transmission here so the older people should stay home uh, and be more careful uh, these coming weeks or so on and uh, you can also uh, uh, the health departments they have the ability to actually contact people and uh, interview them and try to find out are there a common source for for the uh for the infections of these people so it's sort of it's not a detection of outbreaks in this case it's sort of monitoring of an existing outbreak to see if there are flare ups mm-hmm. sort of hotspots 
Okay, okay. So when you say cluster detection system, Martin, is it in some sort of unsupervised machine learning met- method or something different? Yeah, so it uses uh, uh, what's called a scan statistic, uh-huh. which is a circle of different sizes and different locations that you sort of scan across the city and both small circles and large circles. Yeah. So we don't have any prior... Uh, idea of where there could be uh, uh, an increase of cases. Yeah. If we want to test uh, whether it's in Queens or Bronx or Staten Island, the northern part or the southern part of, of Manhattan and so on, and it could be a very small one with only maybe one or two census tract, or it could be a larger one stretching uh, like a large part of Queens, for example. So we don't want to have a preconceived ideas uh, we let basically let the the system decides where is the most evidence for uh, a cluster or for a, a, a hotspot of cases. Okay. And then we do, then we do the same in time. So it's the it, the circle is sort of in geography, but then we have time. So we make a cylinder now. Yeah. And the cylinder is then uh, so the height of the cylinder is the number of days. So if we, for example, have only one day and a large geographic, it will be like a pizza. It's yeah. a large, uh, but if it's only a small area, but for maybe uh, 10 days, it would be like a pencil, right. like very long and narrow. Yeah. So it, it sort of scans all these different shapes and sizes and locations to see where is the biggest evidence for mm. an excess. And then it uses statistics to determine, is this likely to be by chance uh, or is it really something that's so large that it is unlikely to have occurred by chance, and therefore there's some underlying factors uh, driving uh, those cases in that cluster? Okay, okay. So if I understand this correctly, Martin, if you have sort of an inverted cone-type shape, uh, then uh, that, is, that indicates that the infection over time is increasing in a small area? Uh, we are not looking... Yeah, so we have a cylinder, oh, okay. and if the cylinder is, let's say, three days, yeah, then we know, okay, it's more in those three days than there was in that same area to the prior days. Okay, okay. And it's more in that particular area than there is in other areas in the city at the same time period. And so the areas are not predetermined, right? How, how Correct. Do you, how do you select the areas then? They are not predetermined, yeah. Uh, but how do you select... You know, how do you select the, the placement of the circles to, to detect the issue? So we place them all over the city yeah. in every possible location. And then we use every like possible size up to some maximum of this, usually half the population size of the city. Uh, and then we use different lengths because it could be that it's a very rapid increasing outbreak or, or, or emerging. So it's only one or two days. Yeah. But it could also be more slowly, so you won't see it unless you look at 10, 10 or 20 days. Okay, okay. And you're using both census data uh, as well as other data. So what, what are the data sets that go into this? So that's different for different uh, diseases. So for COVID, yeah. uh, what, what uh, the, the New York City Health Department is using are uh, positive tests. Okay. And using it in two ways. First, to say what is the what's the absolute number of positive tests, mm-hmm. but that could change because if they suddenly start testing somewhere, it could just increase because testing is increasing. Right. So uh, we also do the percent positive tests. So now we have the number of tests as the denominator, and the positive ones as the numerator. Yeah. So we're sort of using both of those things and. If both of those light up, those then there's sort of uh, uh, likely that it's actually something truly underlying with the disease, and it's not an artifact of the data collection. Right, right. And so th- this information is coming to you from hospitals or testing centers on a real-time basis, or uh, yes, it's uh, coming f- exactly, and it's uh, uh, near real time. I mean, it takes uh, from the actual testing to finding out when the whether the test is positive enough can take uh, a couple of days, and then uh, but the data arrives every day yeah. to the uh, city health department, and then the analysis is done every day in a very prospective manner. Right, uh, right. 
I know that um, uh, Google, for example, had done some work. Uh, this area appears to be very amenable for AI type efforts. So Google had something that I can quite remember a few years ago that was able to identify flu uh, flu outbreaks. Uh, do you see some sort of nationwide surveillance system um, might be useful not only for COVID, but maybe um, other issues that we may run into in the future? Uh, so there has been uh, plenty of nationwide uh, similar studies. For example, I've done some on cancer. Yeah. We will look at the uh, spread of cancer nationally to see if there are certain areas of the country that have more cancer than others. Mm. Uh, for COVID, we have done that on a national scale also, uh, uh, together with, uh, I've done that with two different collaborators. One is with uh, uh, Professor Roy Amin at University of West uh, Florida, yeah. uh, where we have looked at mortality and uh, uh, on a nat- nationwide scale, mm. and we can find uh, sort of what are the the current hotspots in in the as, as the in the country as a whole. Yeah. Uh, the purpose of that is a little bit different from the New York City, uh, uh, but uh, sort of equally interesting, I think. And then I also be collaborating with uh, uh, with Facebook and uh, a company like Aladaje, mm-hmm. uh, who is a primary care uh, uh, company. And what Facebook has done, it has done surveys of. Uh, uh, sim- uh, uh, sympt- symptoms of uh, COVID-19 type symptoms. Yeah. So Facebook's users are asked, do you feel sick today? Uh, what kind of symptoms do you have? And so on. And then they can see what proportion in different uh, locations have, uh, have uh, uh, symptoms of COVID-19. And then we can see if there are any clusters of that. Right. And, uh, of course, there's pros and cons of using uh, symptoms versus mortality. Uh, ultimately, mortality is what's the most important, but uh, symptoms is very interesting because uh, it, it comes earlier. Uh, between symptoms and mortality, there could be a couple of weeks. So if you want to sort of to have very early monitoring system, then uh, there are advantages of symptoms, uh, using symptoms instead, like from the, from the Facebook data. Right. So, so um, uh, going back to the cancer uh, study, are there some readouts from the cancer study? Uh, we have done different cancer studies. For yeah. example, we did one on uh, brain cancer, mm-hmm. and we did find that there were certain areas that had significantly higher uh, mortality, but the excess was very modest. Because okay. we have large sample size, so we have good power to detect changes. But the ex- uh, excess, I forgot now if it was 20 or 30 percent excess or so. So there wasn't any sort of true hotspot of areas with a terribly increased risk. Yeah. Uh, but there were some, uh, uh, some minor differences. And similar to COVID, uh, I would imagine, I know that if you look at just incidence or diagnosis rates, uh, for example, breast cancer, uh, I think the Northeast is a lot higher than the rest of the country, but then uh, there is also this uh, denominator adjustment you have to do in terms of screening modalities in place, right? Uh, that's correct. Uh, so we know, for example, that certain areas in, in, for example, New York City metropolitan area have uh, uh, have higher mortality from, from breast cancer. It's not, it's, it's not uh, a huge, I think it's like maybe 7%, 5%, 10% excess. Mm. Uh, but uh, you're right, if you look at just incidents, that could be driven by screening. Yeah. But actually, you can do this analysis also on, on, on uh, screening mm. uh, to see where uh, are people screened uh, more or less for cancer screening. And then you can find areas not... So, so now we don't want to find classes with high areas, but we want to find classes with low areas where there are few people who are getting screened. Right. And then we can say, okay, in this area, we really have to improve uh, uh, breast cancer screenings or colorectal cancer screening uh, because they sort of, they are, uh, they're not getting the screening that they should have to save lives. Yeah, that's that's really interesting area. As you know, there is a big debate going on in terms of 
uh, screening. And, you know, um, one, uh, one faction argue that, yeah, if you live long enough, everybody will get cancer. <laughs> and so if you have, you know, screening modalities in place, very, very aggressive screening, you're going to find it. Uh, but then the question is, you know, is there an optimum level uh, of screening that, that might be, you know, sort of societally optimum? Um, I know that's, that's a different question. I, I, I just wondered if you had any views on that. Well, this is a very important question, and I think it depends on the type of cancer. Hmm. Uh, and then it depends on age, because, uh, for example, for, for mammography screenings, uh, there's... Uh, there's no point in uh, screening very young women because they are very unlikely to have uh, have cancer. Neither would you uh, uh, screen the very oldest uh, patients because they are likely to die for something else before yeah. they succumb to, to the cancer. So there's sort of a sweet spot in terms of the age, typically, mm -hmm. when you want to do the, the screening. And that depends, depends on what type of screening, uh, cancer it is. Yeah. And so talking about age, uh, we are dealing with a similar situation on COVID. You had a couple of op-eds uh, on, uh, based on that Swedish age-based COVID-19 strategy. And um, uh, clearly there is a big difference. Um, age is, I believe, the, the most uh, powerful predictor in terms of mortality in COVID. That's true. Uh, and, and you were arguing, you know, in terms of interventions, uh, you really have to take age into account and come up with customized uh, interventions, right? Correct. So I think that the, the optimal strategy to minimize uh, death from COVID is to do uh, age-based countermeasures where we need to do a much better job protecting the elderly, mm -hmm. uh, especially the people above 70, but also people in the 60s who are at, uh, some, uh, are, are at higher risk. Yeah. So that should be the focus to protect the older people in society, while children have very little risk, and uh, uh, children have less risk from. So for children, COVID nineteen, it's much less dangerous than just the annual flu. Mm. More children die from the annual flu than are at risk from dying from COVID. While among the older people, COVID nineteen is a much worse disease with much higher mortality. And yeah. as one uh, one example is from Sweden, which I think was the only Western country who did not close its schools during the height of the pandemic. It yeah. uh, uh, from daycare to um, to uh, 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 grade nine, it kept the schools open throughout, and there was not a single child uh, aged one to fifteen which is the age group uh, of, of, of those uh, schools who, who died from COVID. So not a single one. So they're not really at uh, higher risk from COVID-19. Yeah. But the, the worry, um, uh, Martin, has been that if, if the transmission probability is roughly the same uh, at, at all ages, uh, the question has always been, yes, the mortality rates are lower in kids, uh, but if, if you get, you know, clusters of infections uh, among kids and they go home, uh, they could infect parents, grandparents, uh, and th that has always been the issue. So, so, so how do you think that could be, that could be um, handled? Yeah, so that's a very important issue to consider. And especially in light of influenza, for influenza, we know that the, ch the children are like uh, major vectors of spreading uh, influenza. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, they might get it and then they may infect their, their grandparents, for example, or parents. Uh, but uh, for COVID-19, uh, we now know that children, uh, I'm sure they can spread the disease, but they spread it less than adults do. And we can see that again from Sweden because uh, not opening, the, uh, keeping the schools open, they did a study comparing the risk for teachers having COVID-19 versus all other professions. Mm -hmm. And the teachers had uh, the same risk as the average of other professions. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, the relative risk was, I think, 0 0.9 for the daycare teachers and 1.1 for the primary and middle school teachers, but it was not significantly di di different from uh, from one of no access risk. So uh, uh, that sort of uh, shows, I think that uh, since teachers are no uh, at no higher risk than uh, other professions, uh, there's no sort of uh, special, the, the schools and the children are not the driving force yeah. Uh, of the epidemic. I'm sure there are cases where a child has transmitted to an adult, uh, uh, but uh, uh, they are certainly not the driving force of this uh, pandemic. Okay. Yeah, but, but of course, you know, Sweden is a nice laboratory experiment, uh, national strategy, very consistent. Uh, and uh, good follow through uh, with uh, with suggested protocols. Uh, I don't know if that is really scalable, uh, uh, Martin. I would love to get your impression. Is it really scalable to a country like the U.S.? Uh, I think that uh, I think it is. Um, I don't think there's any reason. There, I don't think there are any scientific reasons not to open the schools. Yeah. Um, there are certain uh, uh, one should do it in a in a careful manner, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think that should certainly be able to be scalable to the United States. I think what the the problem for the United States is that uh, we have already had a lockdown for a long time, so the older population has already been in lockdown for six months, mm -hmm. uh, uh, almost by now. Yeah, and an age-based approach would require them to continue to self-isolate for at least another half a year. Mm. And that's, of course, is going to be tough for the, for the elderly. Mm. But the longer we sort of, push, the longer we keep the lockdown and the longer we, the longer we uh, sort of keep a lockdown on the younger people, mm -hmm. the longer it will take until the society builds up immunity. Right, and that's the uh, the the only thing that will, in the long term, protect the elderly is immunity, either through uh, national infection by those that are younger and not at risk or not as much risk, uh, or through a vaccine. Uh, and of course, vaccine we hope we will get it at some point, but we don't know when and if that will happen. Right. Yeah, and and of course, in the absence of a vaccine. Uh, getting to herd immunity levels, which I believe is like 70% uh, infection rate for for a society, uh, that seems nearly impossible, right? Without a, without a vaccine, natural herd immunity? Uh, the best way to reach herd immunity is through a vaccine. Yeah. Uh, so that's for sure. So that's the ideal way to do it. But we don't know what percentage is needed to reach herd immunity. Mm. And I, I've seen sort of numbers uh, floating around there, but no respectable epidemiologist would sort of claim that it is a certain number. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a study by uh, uh, Sunatra Gupta, who is a professor of uh, 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 infectious disease epidemiology in, in Oxford in, in, in England, yeah. uh, one of the best uh, infectious disease epidemiologists in the world. And uh, she sort of showed in the paper that we don't know, but it could be anything from 10 to 20 oh, percent wow. okay. up to well above 50 percent or 70 percent or so. Right. So we don't know, but it could be very well be uh, 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 smaller. And it also actually depends on who is the one getting infected, mm -hmm. because if the elderly, uh, if they are infected, uh, like uh, Uncle James uh, who spends most of his time at home and doesn't go out and socialize very much, if he gets infected, that doesn't really matter much for herd immunity because he's unlikely to infect others anyhow. <laughs> right, right, yeah. On, on the other hand, uh, the 24-year-old pizza delivery boy who runs around the neighborhood delivering pizza, uh, he has much more opportunity to spread the disease. So if he gets infected and he gets immune, yeah. That will slow down the spread. So there are sort of certain super spreaders. Yeah. And they tend to be part of the working age populations. 
and it's not only by profession it's also uh, who are more social and uh, who are more about uh, out and about and so on mm. so it's really those uh, who tend to spread it more they are the ones who needs to be uh, immune to create herd immunity right and they are also usually the ones who will be infected the first because they are out and about right so therefore uh, and that's that's one reason why uh, the number needed to for herd immunity might be much much less uh, uh, in the potentially even as low as 10 to 20 percent but we don't know what that uh, is it could be 30 percent 40 50 who knows yeah yeah it's a guess so that that is encouraging though so my understanding martin is that the incidence rates that we are measuring uh is, is significantly lower than actual infection rate because uh, many people are asymptomatic. Uh, many don't really develop uh, serious uh, symptoms. And so do you have an idea what that factor might be that is actually infected uh, divided by actually seen or measured? Uh, we don't know that either uh, because we can do the test for antibodies. Yeah. But we know that people who are some people who get sick, they don't develop antibodies because the other parts of the immune system, like the T cells, that can also help. And you're very right that there are many people who get infected that infected that are either asymptomatic or only have very mild symptoms. And that's especially true among the, the younger people. Yeah. So it's very hard to know to estimate how many people have actually uh, or become immune to right. uh, to the uh, to COVID. Uh, we have sort of lower bounds on it, but we don't have uh, good uh, estimates of it. Yeah, yeah. And the other uncertainty here is um, antibodies. How you know sort of the the resident time of those antibodies in the in the system after getting an infection? Do you get reinfected? Uh, as an aside, I was very disappointed to get a negative antibody test. Uh, I was so convinced that I had it already because I came back from New York in January and I had 103 degree fever for about three days and it kind of went away. I thought you know, I was I was covered, but I had a negative antibody uh, result um, uh, in, in tests. Uh, do, do you have a sense of uh, whether those tests are useful or uh, whether even after developing an antibody response that you don't actually maintain it? Uh, yeah, so if, if it had been positive, that would have been good for you because then you know you would have been infected. Right. And you have been uh, sort of have immunity. Now you don't know whether you, you might still have been infected and you may still have immunity, but you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, yeah. So uh, I want to shift gears and talk about um, it, another article that you had, and this is about uh, vaccine safety surveillance, and um, and so this is this is very topical as I think we have something like eight vaccines uh, getting closer to the gate uh, in a few months, uh, but you say that rare but serious adverse events associated with vaccine or drugs are often nearly impossible to detect. Uh, in in uh, preclinical studies uh, and rather in clinical studies and require monitoring after introduction of the agent in large populations. And you argue that sequential testing procedures are needed to detect vaccine or drug safety problems as soon as possible after introduction. You want to talk a bit about that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so whether it's a vaccine or a drug, when FDA approves it, uh, it may have been tested on a thousand people and some vaccines is more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that means that if there is a common adverse reaction, then we will find out about it. And if it was a very serious one, then it would not be approved. So it would never come into common use. Yeah. Uh, if it's a mild one, for example, many vaccines have some mild uh, uh, adverse reactions like a, a rash at the site of the injection or maybe a slight fever. But uh, those are sort of mild uh, adverse reactions that we accept as, uh, as uh, better to have that than to get the disease uh, later on. Right. But there can be uh, less common uh, but serious adverse reactions that we don't find out because suppose 
uh, suppose we try it on a thousand people and one person dies of a heart attack. Uh, well, probably it was not due to the vaccine because people will die of heart attacks for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, 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 if it is due to the to to the vaccine or drug, then we don't have enough statistical power to actually determine that if it's only something that happens to one in a thousand people. Okay. So what we have done is for vaccines uh, with the Centers for Disease Control uh, in a product called the Vaccine Safety Data Link which is a collaboration between the CDC and a number of health plans, into, including the Kaiser Health Plans in California, yeah. is that whenever now there is a, a new vaccine coming out, like a new childhood vaccine, we will monitor the safety of that vaccine on a weekly basis. So every week we get uh, data from the health plans of everybody uh, uh, who got the vaccine. Yeah. And what kind of uh, health events did they had during the weeks following the vaccine? Uh, and then we can monitor to see if there are any health outcomes that are more common after the vaccine than what would happen by chance. Mm -hmm. And we use, do that using sequential statistical analysis, sort of adjusting for the fact that we're actually monitoring this on a weekly basis. Every week we test the same analysis as uh, as more data trickle in. Right. And when we did that, for example, there was a new vaccine uh, some years ago, a new measles containing vaccine. It was a, vac a combined vaccine for measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella, uh, yeah. where all four, uh, all four are in the same needle instead of having two different needles before, one for measles, mumps, rubella, and a separate needle for uh, varicella chickenpox. Yeah. So the idea is that children do not like needles. So if we can <laughs> reduce number of needles uh, from two to one, that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, 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 so we, when the new vaccine came out, we monitored the vaccine to see if there were any unsuspected problems with it. Mm -hmm. And we compare then the rate of adverse reactions from the new vaccine with the old vaccine. And after about 25,000 doses of the new vaccine, we found that the new vaccine had an increased risk of febrile seizures uh, seven to 10 days after the vaccine was given. Hmm. And that was in the, those who get the first dose at one year old, those who get the second dose at around age five, they did not have an excess risk. So it was only a, a, an excess risk for those uh, getting the first dose, which is really given between 12 and 18 months of age. Uh, so uh, that was sort of an unsuspected but unnecessary uh, adverse reaction. So what happens then was that the CDC uh, sort of changed back the recommendation and said, well, uh, you can give this new vaccine to the five-year-olds, but to the one-year-olds, you should not. You should actually use the two needles uh, yeah. with MMR and Rysela separately to to minimize the number of febrile seizures that these uh, children uh, experience. And febrile seizure is not like a life-threatening or something that would lead to uh, long-term health uh, consequences, but it's sort of a scary thing for the parents to uh, to deal with. Yeah, vaccines are interesting. So it's not only the, the agent, but also uh, the modality, how you administer it, right? I, I read some some studies in COVID, for example, they're saying you need dual uh, dual administration or something like that. Yeah, that's very common in many vaccines that you need okay. to give two doses, uh, or sometimes even three, actually. Yeah. But I think some of the COVID vaccines, they're expecting uh, that we need two. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the good thing about the vaccines is that um, provided we get sufficient adoption of it, uh, we will get fairly large numbers quickly, I would imagine, right? So that makes it easier. Uh, you mean with uh, with the safety surveillance? or with the, with, the, with the safety surveillance, yeah. There will be a very large number of people adopting it. It makes it easier, right? Uh, yeah, so that means that we find uh, can find uh, potential problems faster. Yeah. It's a little bit nervous, actually, because we're setting up to do this for the COVID as, uh, vaccines as soon as they are approved. Yeah. But it's a little bit nervous because... Usually with the childhood vaccines, it's sort of a, a it's given to a new cohort. Mm -hmm. So there's like a steady, uh, a slow but steady uh, 
uh, a flow of, uh, of, of children who get vaccinated. So uh, even if it takes uh, a month or two to find a problem, there wasn't that many children who had actually been exposed right. to it. So with uh, COVID-19, if there are millions and millions who are exposed in the first few weeks, mm. it gets trickier because uh, some of these adverse reactions might not show up uh, within a few weeks. It might, maybe it is something that happens after four or five weeks. Yeah. And that's sort of okay for childhood vaccination because it's a fairly slow uptake. So uh, you, you can still sort of, uh, but it's much more difficult for, for COVID-19 as uh, similar to uh, the new influenza vaccines. Yeah. So, you know, the other aspect there is even if the, uh, the side effects are minor for whatever reasons. If the first trial, uh, the first, first candidate had to be discontinued for whatever reasons, uh, then uh, I would imagine the compliance rate and the adoption rate will drop significantly. So- uh, that's very true. And that's a, a big concern. If the first one comes out, has some unexpected problem yeah that would be ne- people have less confidence when the second one comes out right right and just as an as an aside uh, martin i i i read some um some uh, information around the bcg vaccine which as you know has been around for a long time uh for tb and um in a study that compared eastern european population where bcg was more prevalent compared to Western Europe, uh, BCG appears to have some sort of a protective effect because the mortality rate in Eastern Europe uh, per capita is much lower. Do you have any sense of that being true or or potentially true? <laughs> uh, you mean protective for COVID-19? Uh, for COVID-19, yeah. I yeah. Think, yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I have not read those studies carefully. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because so that uh, would be very uh, interesting to know, of course. Yeah, you know, uh, a lot of the developing countries, like uh, you know, the, those in Africa and India, places like that, uh, BCG was very common. Uh, and if you look at, for example, mortality in India, it, it appears to be lower than uh, Western Europe as well. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, the if something like that is true. Uh, the good thing about that is that we know the safety profile of BCG because it has been around for a long, long time. Uh, it, it won't be a big deal to, to kind of make it widely available, but uh, obviously more studies are needed. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, there's a lot to, there's a lot to learn about COVID-19. There's so <laughs> yeah. much uh, we don't know yet, and eventually we will learn more, but uh, that takes time. Yeah, so if you look forward a year or so, uh, Martin, what's your sense, uh, you know, in terms of where we are, uh, whether we get a vaccine that's effective and uh, how we would actually get this in, a, in an efficient way into the population? What is your, what's your gut feel? I think it's very difficult to predict about vaccines. Uh, the best scenario is that we have, uh, I mean, my estimate that we'll have it sometime between six months from now and never. Wow. Okay. And it's very hard to uh, to estimate because it has to be uh, have good efficacy and has to be uh, safe. And uh, for some diseases, we've been very successful developing vaccine, and for other ones, we have not been successful. Yeah, yeah. So, HIV is a good example, right? Exactly. Yeah. There are some vaccines, but uh, they're not high quality, so I don't think they are widely used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's hope that uh, we get uh, we get a good one uh, soon enough. Uh, this has been great, uh, Martin. Thanks so much for spending time with me. And uh, uh, good luck with all your statistical studies. I think that they are sorely needed. Uh, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.